Okay, uh, here we are for the fourth panel. Theory from discourse to practice. Theory and history have been the solid platforms for references to build the necessary intellectual body of practice architecture. Today, the contingency and the solidarity that our complex world demands of the architecture needs a blurring of the boundaries between theory and practice. Critical practice together with practical critic is the question. Some emerging practices operate generating new theories of design through their work, and we have invited three of them to our evening session. Fala Atelier. Ania Luisa Soares and Felipe Magalaes founded Fala Atelier in Porto, 2013. Their work is a model of contingency and use of architecture as an instrument of exploration of the poetic condition hidden in banal contexts and very low budgets. Their practice is an expression of how to build powerful narratives with very weak ingredients. Lanza Atelier, Isabel Martinez Abascal and Alessandro Arienzo have been involved from the beginning of their professional years in the brewing territories between speculation, research, edition, curatorial and professional work. Isabel was for three years the curator of Liga in Mexico City and both separately and in collaboration with other colleagues have designed plenty of installations and small projects. In fact, in 2015, they founded Lanza Atelier in Mexico City. Plural, plural, plural was established in 2009 in Bratislava by its two partners, Martin Jankok and Michel Janak. Its aim is to propose architecture with emphasis on its social and cultural relevance. Their strategy to address present complexity is based in the statement that architecture is a common language with a formal and structural grammar and vocabulary. In a context where architectural production is in the hands of private developers, and I'm seeing that is not the only today, the office is in a contest search of generosity, trying to find the potential in the pre-existing and the in living a space for the unforeseen. The moderator for this panel will be Andres Jaque. Andres Jaque is an associate professor of professional practice at Columbia GSAP, where he directs the AAD program. Jaque is the founder of the Office of Political Innovation and Architectural Practice based in New York and Madrid. His work is in itself a collection of incursions into the fields of action that we have proposed today from sustainability to politics, from technology to theory. So he's the person to close this session. So um, thank you, all, first of all, for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, even more with such a heavy theme, theory. It's a very, it's a very heavy, heavy word. OK, thank you. Um, so si since our, since the, I'm just going to put the time. So, since our uh, since our theme was so big uh, and so heavy in a way, we went back to the email of the invitation where there was a small comment on the side talking about uh, how important it would be that we would be able to frame our practice and to frame how we became a practice for the for the audience. So we took it quite literally, and that's what we. What are we going to try to do today in 20 minutes to somehow say where we come from, where we are, and what we believe to be where we are heading? And uh, this office showed up before today. Uh, our practice started while working for other practices. We are part of the generation that was born between 87 and 91, the three of us, and the four of us. Uh, and um, we are students that did Erasmus, we are students that did internships abroad, we are architects that started mostly uh, dreaming about becoming our own heroes, of, of becoming our heroes, uh, I mean, and um, we started by mostly trying to absorb from, from third parties. So between Japan, New York, Switzerland, Portugal, Slovenia, Gothenburg, uh, so Sweden, uh, Singapore, we were a bit um, everywhere and we were just somehow collecting from all of those places. But the office, the, the, the name Fala, the, the, whole, the, whole, the, whole, the whole practice started in, the, in Japan in 2012 at the Nakazin Capsule Tower, specifically on that one. And this was where we understood how much we were willing to sacrifice the three hours of sleep we had a day to become an office. 
because despite the fact that we were working 16-hour shifts in very fantastic offices, we were still finding the energy to discuss together and to create very radical uh, competition proposals to trying to convince our family members to do a house or, well, a dog house or whatever they could afford. We, we, we were trying to sacrifice everything because we believed that uh, if you're going to work 16 hours a day for something, do it for yourself. That was, that was the, the motivation. And so we came back to Portugal. We invited Ahmed to join us. Ahmed had a very different education from ours. He came from Eteha, Zurich. And the worst teacher he ever had was probably the best teacher we would ever dream of having. And he convinced us that the real way to go was Switzerland. It was this idea that we were going to do competitions in this scenario where in this kind of El Dorado of uh, architecture competitions and we did it and we did it once twice three times 20 times 50 times and we lost all of them and we lost well we we know how to lose we lose very we lose in style in a way we could say um, but uh, it generated a moment it generated a certain energy a certain speed we bought an office the office was 25 square meters we were free it was perfect at some point we were already 10 and it was still 25 square meters so we were using only one table so you can see this was the the daily, the daily scenario. So if you had a client, everyone would move around to one side and we would discuss on the other side. If we were discussing a budget, a project, if we were talking about anything, everyone was part of it. So this idea that the whole family sits together for dinner was a, a kind of daily uh, routine. And it became our laboratory. It became the place where we tested options, where we designed proposals, where we discussed architecture, where we discussed budgets, contracts, the whole thing. So. In a way, it became the perfect scenario for our practice because despite the fact I'm supposed to address theory, everything we do is driven from very banal commissions, very low budgets. Most of our clients, they don't care at all about architecture. So it's actually a kind of, uh, you know, the Don Quixote metaphor. We are creating our own windmills to create and pick our own fights. And this became what we call the Fala family. So the people that came, that passed by, that left something, that took something with them. And all of them, in a way, they are responsible for whatever we are today. And if we are here talking today, it's because at some point, all of these people were through that room. And this is, this is what Fala was. Uh, so as a conclusion, the, Fala was a ghost town. It had literally zero, nothing built, no uh, real commissions, no clients. It was. Uh, a series, there, there was a series of expectations, there was a huge ambition, but all the, the, the facades were actually fake. And what happened is that with time we started understanding that we were not going to build a city from scratch, but we can replace one of these fake facades at a time and maybe if everything was okay, one day we might be a full city without fake facades at all. And so every commission we got, we addressed it with all our energy, like we, we were invited to design an exhibition for the Lisbon Triennale and they didn't give us budget, so we paid for it, we built it, we carried the metal, three tons of metal to the second level on our backs, and uh, because, I mean, that, that, that was what we had, that was, that was what we could do, and when we got some prizes for competitions, like this was a mention we got for the Chicago Biennale, uh, we couldn't build it because it was too expensive, and because we didn't get the first prize, which is also important. But uh, we thought, what if, what if all of this energy is channeled to something else and we design our first built project, which was a house for a bird? And the fact that the client was a bird doesn't make it less of architecture. It was a very demanding client. They have a series of specific requirements. And when we went to take the photos uh, on a bird fair, because there's a bird fair in Porto, people wanted to buy it. Uh, so I think, let's say, the clients were happy somehow. Uh, and as time passed by, we started via the weirdest possible scenarios, we started getting some sort of private commissions, mostly due to this gentrification process that is happening in the south of Europe, mostly in Portugal, where everyone can get a nationality if they spend 500,000 in an investment. Uh, so if you need a passport, you know, call us. And what happened is that we got a one project like this, another project like this, another project like that. So we were somehow transforming given perimeters. So let's say the building was already there. We were somehow doing interior work. We were discussing architecture, talking at, you know, we were discussing Palladio to refurbish a bathroom. So it was kind of, uh, kind of, 
very, very schizophrenic. And as these commissions kept piling up, at some point we had our first building, which of course was half a building, a kind of Frankenstein, because again, there's a given structure and we need to operate on it. And we felt like, what if we react to the context, this kind of old granite heavy context, and we play with the cheapest, lightest materials? I mean, we are talking about a building that is built with less than 250 euros per square meter. This is less than a third of what social housing costs in Portugal. So the client didn't want to work with us. The client doesn't even know we are called Fala. He knows Philip. That's the person he always talked with, so he knows I exist, he doesn't know anything else. And he couldn't care any less about the design proposal, but he let us have a certain... So we, we made a windmill out of him so we could fight him, and we created this project. And as this kept piling up, we got to a point where once in a while the clients were not paying attention to what we were proposing, so we were pushing the envelope as far as possible. Other times they were, so we had to paint them in white. And other times we were the, our, the, the clients, so we did a kind of hybrid between both because we didn't have enough money to do the first one. And as the projects kept piling up, we started understanding that our work was divided in two layers. One layer was this idea that projects are the core nucleum of architecture. So you do a project, you do a house, you do a museum, you do a school. And a second layer would be the tropes, this idea that are themes within the projects that repeat so many times that at some, time, at some point they become a project of their own. And this is a trope we like to discuss a lot. Uh, we call them careful mystics, you know, the idea that you make mistakes on purpose but you treat them very gently. And sometimes the, 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 the projects, they become a lot about a certain element, about a certain, a certain column that holds nothing, about a certain circle or dot that marks an entrance. And as the office started, you know, expanding and started having more and more work, we started touching different kinds of structure from 16, uh, 60, uh, six, 600 square meters, palaces, and I don't know how you do, uh, we use the metric system, I really don't understand your system, so the, from six, 600 square meter palaces in the historic center to houses of 12 square meters, I mean, to, from the city center to the suburbs, we started intervening these given structures and uh, changing them, and at some point we were finally invited to design buildings from scratch, houses mostly, for single family houses for young families, most of them also in the in the suburbs, and we started for the first time having the opportunity to do those blue models of several volumes just to see how the house is going to look like. We didn't do them anyway because we didn't have the time and we were not paid for that, but we, we had finally the opportunity, if so, to, to test such a tool. We are obsessed with the geometry of plans and how rigorous and, let's say, stiff a plan can be, so at some point we thought it was a good moment to look back and to draw all our plans at the same scale with the same graphical code to try to understand what else we were trying to do besides these individual projects and we understood that somehow these tropes, they were actually binding all of them. They became some sort of archipelago. They were not individual islands anymore. We went back to the collages that somehow became a thing. I mean, we do them as a working tool, not as a communication one. And somehow we understood that they grew up to be seen as something else. And we put them all together. And we started, because we had compiled so many of them, redrawing all the elevations and also bringing them together with the drawings and the collage and creating this kind of triangle of this kind of romantic love affair between these three elements and to try to understand what the hell are we trying to do? What is what is really the message behind the architecture we are trying to propose? And as such, we, we, we also try to do this study where we try to, to merge uh, via the drawings all the information and the core of each, the intentions of each project into a single drawing. And as the projects kept piling up, these drawings started getting more and more complex and more and more deconstructive, uh, de deconstructed. And somehow, they are not easy to read, uh, mostly for people who don't know them, but they, they say so much to us. So they became a kind of uh, cathartic uh, element at the end of the project that somehow summarizes all the battles that we had, again, with the windmill. And we were lucky enough to see most of the projects we designed being built. Some of them are already finished, some of them are under construction. And for us it was always a moment of, uh, how do you say, uh, reassurance to, to go back on, the, on site and to, to look at the, that facade we designed and to see how it was showing up, how it was actually composed, how it was built, what, what, what was actually hiding behind the white surface and so on. And to see the different stages that in order to achieve that beam at the end, we need to somehow do some sort of planning of the beam long before. So uh, as I said, our theory comes a lot from this very practical uh, necessities. And our construction, as you can see in most of these photos, is the least high-tech thing you can have. I mean, this is a house of 350 square meter again. So 
everything was very was very rough in that sense, but at the same time quite delicate. And sometimes things change, like the client says he doesn't like pink anymore, so you can only do blue doors. But the 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 the, the elegance of the column that doesn't touch the ceiling remains there. And somehow this this all of these references that we brought from before, from Shinohara to Markley to Caesar to Botta to Tsukazagawa, they all found their own their own space in our bookshelf. And at some time, in a project here and there, uh, sometimes stronger, sometimes less. And I mean, it's, for us, it's very important sometimes to, to say that despite some of the interventions seeming extremely subtle, they come from very, again, very brutal, very rough uh, interventions. And more important than the plasticity of it, this is the cheapest plaster one can have, it's about how all of these small pieces, they represent very severe corrections on an architecture that we wanted to, to deny, to annul. And we got used to see architecture in a before and after condition, mostly because most of our projects, they started with given structures. So this idea that there's a before and there's a promise of an after. And we also got used to see them as the after and the after party, you know, when it's actually built. So if this stage represents the architecture itself, that's the, the celebration moment, because it's the moment where it actually happened. Because to a certain extent, most of the times we start a project, we don't really, we don't really believe it's going to go all the way until the end. And we were lucky enough to start teaching in different institutions in Europe. And as we start teaching, we also found a time, I don't know how, to do some research projects. And as we did these research projects, we focused on the themes that attract us the most, which in this case, it's a very specific typology from Porto. We call them the ugly ducks, buildings that our parents don't like. And at the same time, these obsessions of the references that we also had from before, which are much more uh, majestic, uh, found their way through, in this case again in the US, to the Chicago Biennial, where we depicted a series of houses from the turn of the 70s to the 80s from Japan. And recently, we found our work as the motive of exhibitions, which is, uh, it's, it's quite a, I mean, in a way, it's super nice. My parents like to tell it to their friends, but at the same time, it's quite an uncomfortable position because it takes away the seriousness of our discipline and somehow puts us in the realm of art, uh, per se. So, But it's, it's something we are still getting used to. And this is how the office expanded between projects, exhibitions, commissions, collaborators, talks. You know, everything was happening everywhere. So if, if more than saying that we are a Portuguese office, I would say we are an European office. But it's in Portugal we work, and in Portugal we are now with this problem, which is the, 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 the excess of nostalgia, fake nostalgia, because everything that is old, even if it doesn't hold anymore, we preserve it at all costs, and everything that is new looks old. So somehow it's, it's becoming quite complicated to do architecture in this scenario. So front facades are protected, because more important than the locals are the tourists, and they came to Portugal to spend money in our visas and to see old stuff. So we need to keep the old stuff so that they are happy. And then we make the back facades the main facades of our architecture. So our front facades are facing the back, and our back facades are facing the front. So somehow, this architecture became very proud as a, or in this specific project, because it was a manifesto project. There was this, it's, it's revolting that you are, that you have people within a desk 5,000, kilo, uh, 500 kilometers away making decisions on what tourists want to see instead of actually discussing architecture as it is. But as a consequence, because we do this pretty much alone, our project is designed as this kind of uh, autist creature, and this is how the city sees it. The city is not very happy. But we fooled them because on the permit we just said natural stone cladding, we just didn't design the pattern, so they never understood what was going to come after, and now they, they evaluate our permits with twice the attention. And so this, this is a little bit how we feel. Everyone is clapping, but they don't really know at what, and sometimes it's how, how we find ourselves. And now we are in this condition where uh, we are designing these buildings in quite, quite uh, interesting scenarios because the city center got to prices that are completely out of scale. So all the investors they are moving to the suburbs or to the half. It's, it's still in Porto, but it's already a kind of suburban area. So we find ourselves in this scenario between where housing blocks, factories, and the train lines stand. And we are asked to design the, the most straightforward development with 15 studios for students. And you can feel that a plan suggests a certain sense of repetition because the, the minimal area, of course, everything is very efficient and very uh, rule-based. But at the same time, what if you have 15 times the same thing, but you have 15 things that are different from each other? 
including the bathrooms. What if you find a way where every single room is designed in such a way that if you do a storyboard, you never have twice the same perspective? What if you test it in a way where the materiality repeats itself, but you always find a way to create some sort of distinction that makes each of these apartments unique? As you can imagine, the promoter couldn't care any less. He, it, this for him, again, this is not a windmill. This is a gigantic fan of those that you find in the oceans. It's really the enemy we created. And again, as long as we are inside a budget, they are fine with it. As long as we respect the Excel sheets they send us, so that's what we did. And we felt like as a provocation, because this is the highway where about 1.5 million people cross every day, we thought, what if we say something about our architecture, not by writing foul on top of it, but by making it friendly, by making it look like a cat, and cats, they say meow. And what if we find a way where this kind of positive energy goes, you know, like a boomerang, it goes and somehow comes back and brings something together with it. As I said, we were lucky enough to see some of the buildings finished, so this is our first house, Project 23, and it was, it is about to be finished any moment now. The, the, the second house, we, and we usually call it the pornographic house because the relation between private and public programs is very direct. And after that house, we created uh, the a second house, which, was, which is now also under construction, which we call the erotic house because there's a very big negotiation between private and public programs. Different clients, same program, different houses. And for us, it was quite, quite something to be able to work many times in scenarios like this where you have this very regional architecture and you need to fit in because of both local regulations and the requirements of the municipality, but at the same time, you feel good with it. Our architecture is not stick to any kind of, uh, stuck to any kind of uh, language, preconceived ideas, so we are okay with everything as long as we manage to do a good project out of it. And sometimes we get projects like this. This is a very funny one. This is a clothing factory from the 80s that the uh, previous owner designed to look like a house so that it would fit in the context. It's a very fucked up house, but it was his ambition that this was fitting to the context. And he asked us, the second client, so our client, to transform this into social housing. So we felt we have maybe an opportunity to transform the factory that looked like a house into a housing block that looks like a factory. So what if we play with this kind of uh, uh, semantic innuendo, and what if we somehow find a series of rules in which the factory is somehow stuck in the middle of the woods, because this is a very, a very special, special neighborhood, and we play with all of this. So this is the bathroom of one apartment. You can go out and go to the bedroom of the other one, so you can have a very promiscuous lifestyle with your neighbors. But it's, it's, all, about, it's all about this idea of reacting to a, certain, to a certain scenario, to a certain given condition. And inside, the project is the, the, the thing we could afford, 180, no, 280 euros per square meter. Uh, I, I know I say many times these numbers, but it's, 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 really, it's, really, it's a limitation for us. We believe that we could do more if we had the conditions, but we don't. So as Ahmed many times says, we transform the commissions that no one else wants to take into the possi possible architecture we can achieve. And once in a while, very rarely, this happened only once, uh, we got a commission to design a public building, and in this case a very small public building. So a small gallery for the Sao Paulo Biennial, uh, because they had a satellite event in Porto. And we were asked to design, together with a few other architects, pavilions to fit some art pieces. And for us, you see, like the moment this arrived, we started designing folies, 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 because, I mean, we didn't know how to react to it. There was no bathroom and no kitchen to design, so we just got so excited. And we designed this, this, uh, this folie, and we designed a detail with, you know, like half of the beams are actually fake. They are just hanging, so they are doing nothing there. And everything is about how the blue is cut by the pink and how the, the curve is intersecting the structure and so on. But everything is about a certain sense of contradiction, but it was, it was probably the most, uh, the most joyful project we did in the office, like designing a cuckoo clock of some sort. And, um, and then we got back to normal. You know, we got back to, okay, make an apartment out of these 30 square meters granite check. And when we started working on this and we had such, such energy from, from, from before, we felt, okay, now we, we cannot go back. You know, it's one of those things. When you give a few steps in that direction, you don't want to return to where we were before. So we started doing all of these tests, both in terms of the scale and language of the object and in terms of the detail and actual texture and expression of it. And we actually made, uh, we convinced the client to go all the way through and to design this house that actually has all the possible constructive techniques at the same time, wood, metal, granite, concrete, brick, but in the end, it's all white. No one has to, to know about that. And because we fucked up with the detail, we had to double the, the roof, but everyone says it looks very good, so we are happy with it. 
and then we find this kind of sexy elements within the within the within this very small this very small house. But what it really matters to us is the fact that we made a shower that is nine meters tall, and you can see the sky when you shower, and that it has a very strong expression. And the client was very happy because he had a supermarket in the back, and he said he does notice he does not notice the supermarket anymore. So he's very happy with it, and we are very happy because somehow this was the first client that ever came to us and said, "I know your work. I want you to do a project for us that kind of follows the same approach of your other architecture." And this was unique. In 105 projects, this happened once. So it's quite quite fantastic. And this is this is the this is the factory where another client asked us, I need an elevator and a staircase to fit regulations, but we were not very convinced with that. So we did 100, 1,000, 2,000 tests on how we could make a facade out of this, and we proposed that the whole the whole infrastructure had to integrate would somehow become a very proud moment that would become a, a new face for his for his company, and this is an intervention that in plan occupies about one percent of the factory, but in terms of its public appearance, it became 150 percent of the factory, and finally to end. This is, this is our baby, this is our new office, or the building before it became our new office. Because recently we understood that we had to expand, we had to grow, and because after five, six years, uh, 10 people in 25 square meters is not okay, at least in Portugal, it's not okay at all. And clients started noticing that, contractors started noticing that, so we bought this building, we, made a, we gave a leap of faith, uh, we invested a lot, we fully transformed it, and it's now finished, and to make it even more, let's say, uh, compatible with this idea of the Fala family. Me and Anna live on the last floor, Ahmed lives on the middle floor, and the office operates on the ground floor. So somehow we, we, we took this idea of living and working together quite, quite too seriously. And I would like to end with this image, the best movie that Spielberg did, in my opinion, where Peter Pan grows old, so he becomes an adult, and he starts having all of these uh, growing pains. And he goes to London, he starts a company, you know, long story. The point is, the whole movie is about Peter Pan learning that he has to go back to Neverland and he has to fly again and he needs to fight Hook and there's all of this 90s uh, terrible s special effects. And w what, what is the crucial message here is that Robin Williams at some point uh, is told that the only way for him to fly is if he understands why is Peter Pan in the first place. And the reason is that despite the fact that he's growing, that he's becoming an adult, uh, an adult that he has responsibility, that you know, there's a whole life that is not told to us when we are kids that somehow <laughs> happens. He can only fly if he's happy enough and if he understands why he was Peter Pan in the first place, if he understands the joy and the pleasure that being Peter Pan brings. And this is why we are truly convinced that Robin Williams was the best Peter Pan and is the best metaphor for a young practice like ours. So thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. We are really grateful for being here among this amazing group of people that has been so inspiring throughout the day. So. Thank you, Columbia University. Thank you, Juan Herreros. This is a photo of our studio in Mexico City. Lanza Atelier was founded without a very specific plan in 2015. We knew that Lanza was going to be a, a project in itself, and then it would span until there were no boundaries in between Lanza and our lives, which actually happened. In Spanish, Lanza, it's a noun, but also a verb. It's an action, and so we live so we believe that architecture is an action. After some years of practicing individually, um, Alessandro with collaborating with architects as Mauricio Rocha or Frida Escobedo, here we have a floor plan of um, the opening exhibition at Archivo Design and Architecture in Mexico that Alessandro did with another colleague, Rodrigo Escandón, and an image of the Victorian Albert Museum Summer Pavilion by Frida Escobedo with whom Alessandro um, did this project together, and me um, lecturing in Sao Paulo and collaborating and developing some curatorial projects. We have here an image of uh, an exhibition at the Sao Paulo Biennale at the Museum of Modern Art in Sao Paulo by Lina Bovardi that Guilherme Visnik uh, with me assisting that uh, developed, and a floor plan of uh, is the conceptual scheme of um, contemporary art exhibition that I curated in a contemporary art cultural center in Spain. So after all this, we happen to be together living in this very amazing building by Oscar Niemeyer in Sao Paulo. 
when the Mexican government, after building a seven kilometers long bike path in a marginal neighborhood in the north of Mexico City, uh, realized that they had planned no restrooms for it. Alessandro was hired to mend this situation, and we decided to do it as a team. Restrooms were not the only lacking thing at the bike path, but also vegetation, shadows, and mainly any kind of infrastructure that allow people to gather in the public space. So we designed in some restroom and shadow modules, um, exploring their relationships in between inside and outside. We usually use references as driving forces for each project to help us focus on a specific concept and try to go deeper into it. So because of having to supervise this, the construction of this project, Newborn Lanza moved to Mexico City, where they actually stayed until now. We started to work from our living room, and we got an invitation from Saluto Buono, an Italian office, to participate in a book after Super Studio Five Fundamental Acts. We were selected to be under the topic of love, uh, which we liked a lot, and we rewrote an extract from a Super Studio text, exchanging some parts to introduce our biographical story. We just reread this text a couple of days ago, and it, it made much more sense now. So I'm going to read a, uh, an, an extract. At night, we both redream all the architecture we had separately produced. We redream all the buildings we had built and all those we had lovingly measured. We dreamt again of our love for stone, steel, crystal, of that catalog of for an oriental satrapy, certainly written through a fear of death but also written with a furious love for a life of reason for a rich and barred life filled with all the shades, tr uh, transparencies, and glow of marble and mirrors. So these are photos of almost every bed in which we slept while we were living in different countries. Um, the, um, <laughs> the idea that is present here and that we <laughs> I think it's important for the way of doing things at Lanza is the concept of atlas, of selecting and collecting reality pieces and putting them together to find or to suggest a meaning, sometimes a new meaning. So when we moved to Mexico, I had this, we have the empty apartment and we had this housewarming party and we start to to use the slide projector I bought, like a Japanese projector that only allows you to put two slides at a time. So we start playing to super, uh, juxtapose two, two slides at the same time of my grandfather. So we start playing with this um, layering of, of background and figure at the same time. For us, this was our first uh, project without a client. So. At this moment, we took every project or any idea we had very seriously. So after finding Alessandro's grandfather's slides, the connection that, that, that was there in between this process of superimposing layers on our work is the idea of putting together several meanings in a single spatial concept. And depending on how the user focus his or her own perceptive lens, they will experience uh, something different. When curator Jose Esparza invited us to do an um, exhibition design for a series of shows that were going to happen at Hummes Museum, we designed a folding screen that the museum could store uh, in a very small space so that they could reuse it. We designed this folding screen out of um, wood and brass. And because we were still working from our home, uh, in the ground floor of, of our building, there was this wood shop because we wanted to control the production of the folding screen from close, we decided to work with this woodworker with whom we've been working for four years now. The exhibitions that you see here have been taking place since uh, four years now, and we hope they continue to. First one was uh, on Jerzy Grotowski, a, Pol a Polish theater director, so we wanted to create a very dramatic, scenographic atmosphere. And this second one was on um, Californian architecture critics, Thermacoy, so we wanted to give it a much brighter uh, atmosphere. This is the, the third and last one till now on John Cage that the that Humex Museum put together on their own. 
At some point, a final year student came by to interview us for his uh, thesis project about architectural representation, uh, Alejandro Marquez. Uh, some weeks later, he called to say he wanted to work for us, and it was perfect because Isabel was starting to work at Liga, Space for Architecture, being the executive director, and, and she was going to spend more time outside the studio or home. So we accepted the proposition. First, Marcus' uh, challenge was doing this model for, the, for our first uh, expansion of a house. Uh, we had a trip to Spain, so we asked him to make the model and we just say goodbye. So when we returned, this was the, his model and he was hired. <laughs> so that project, um, this is a Felix, Gonzal Felix Gonzalez Torres piece, it's called Pools, that actually saying about two things cannot touch each other. In this case, the water sp splits from one place to another. So being the, the project and extension, we actually were building another facade in, in front of the, uh, the adjacent um, facade. It was a blind facade. The client bought a, a small piece of extra um, terrain. So let me explain the story. The house had a real problem in the living room. Uh, it was very hot, like, it had like a greenhouse effect. So they want to, to change all the facade. We, we made a lot of uh, options, and at the end, they decided that they didn't want to touch the house because they had like a very apprehensive uh, relationship to it. So we decided that the, the main objective to um, make the, um, the hot go away is to make more um, crossing ventilation. So there was another problem that the the rooms weren't uh, didn't have like a hallway to go to a, to the second room. You have to pass through the first room. So we we got the idea to make a a second hallway to organize the the rooms, and um, the heat on the living space actually changed a lot. At that moment, we made tattoos. We're still making tattoos. So we had to pay uh, an employee, and we also needed a space because. I was tired of opening the door in pajamas. So the, the tattoos were the, the side job that actually was financial in the studio. With this, <laughs> sorry. We just wanted to give a message to the students that it's normal to be broke for the several years of practice, so don't worry and keep on. So with these tattoos, uh, we're allowed to move to the, our first office, it's still our same office till now. This is Alejandro Marquez working on the floor. And because of that first tattoo, the brother didn't want to, well, the story is we received an email about having another appointment for his, for his uh, big brother. And the brother actually wanted a house. He didn't want a, a tattoo. So we were super confused about if the house was a house or a tattoo or where it was going to be, you know? So, this house um, is in a, in a forest between Mexico City and, and Toluca. It's, in a, um, it's a very like, fancy um, it's so housing fun. complex. Um, this, the terrain is 2,000 square meters. Uh, we were impressed when we, we got there. Um, we wanted to, to make the house privately because they were very close to the highway and there was a lot of noise, like constant noise, and the houses around that house were very um, yelling or terrible. So we decided to have this uh, wall around the, the trees and let's see. So the house is um, it's a one, it's single floor house and it has like a adjacent building in front of it. So we wanted to have like a surrounding, like to take some part of the woods uh, by our own, maybe you can express it. <laughs> we wanted a house that could contain nature. So we wanted to uh, domesticate a piece of the landscape in order to, for it to become the domestic garden, the family garden, but still be in a forest. Throughout the process, the, the client cut much more trees that we would have loved to, but still we are happy. We spent one year designing the house and we've been two years uh, building the house. So this house is the same age as we are at Lanza, I think. 
So it has grown with us and we've We brought lots of site construction photos so, th so that you can have a sense of how things are made in Mexico. It's a very crafty and handmade uh, base construction system in general. So we get to work really closely with uh, workers and craftsmen. We're doing many uh, tests for this lattice work. After, yes, as I was saying, almost two years, uh, the house is almost completed and the client moved there a couple of weeks ago. So through these years, we were doing lots of exhibition design because they were temporary projects. We were allowed to experiment a lot because those were public clients, institutions. They were not so, they weren't going so crazy about what they wanted and they had to maintain the discussion and the conversation in a professional level. So we were enjoying this kind of um, projects a lot. This is a show for, uh, on Gunter Gerso, an abstract Mexican painter. We designed this um, series of U-shaped um, forms made out of straw. This was an adventure because we had to introduce lots of tons of straw in the, the museum. And at some point we received a, a call from the curator that there was a bag next to a Lucha Fontana picture, but we solved it. And we promised we would uh, <laughs> never use straw again inside a cultural center. So this exhibition had eight cura uh, curators working at the same time, each one with a point of view of Gunter Gerso. So we wanted to reproduce a painting in three-dimensional space. And each curator has his own cell. So the straw bale uh, worked very well for isolating noise and the temperature because we opened the, the space after, I don't know how many, 15 years, it was closed a uh, whole facade because of the sun. So it was interesting to having a, an empty space, but if you go through the space, you actually see the people inside the cells. This is a competition for the Leco Museum. We were continuously refinding geometries that we had used before and re reworking and redeveloping them. Uh, we decided for this uh, competition to use the perimeter of the patio inside the pavilion had to be and reproduce it with a more organic, curvy geometry. We also didn't win. <laughs> But um, everything we at some point design stays in the back of our minds and continuously comes, up, comes out again. We start getting some uh, projects published. It's always nice to have some acceptance of recognition. Uh, this is one of the last exhibition design projects we completed in our first years, year and a half of life. This is uh, at the Mexican National Palace and it's on the public um, treasury collection. In Mexico, if you're an artist, a self-declared artist, you, can, you, you don't have to pay your taxes with money, but you can pay with artwork since 40 years now. So people have this idea that artists are giving their lost pieces, their worst pieces, and this um, show was trying to show the contrary. So this was uh, the tax office, uh, it was the first exp exhibition doing here. It was like, I think around 3,000 square meters. I think it's uh, the biggest building we've made because we couldn't touch the, the walls or anything. We didn't have any museographic infrastructure. So we decided to build the infrastructure permanently for, the, for this space. So we did this uh, frames to hang um, exhibition panels. We work a lot with physical models, as you can see. This allowed us to work very closely with the curator uh, that, of, of course, wanted to move panels from side to side until the very last moment. There were about 300 uh, paintings and like 50 sculptures, so we decided that we, w we, want, we didn't want to show the, the paintings on, in one wall at, at the same time. Instead, we want to have a time and a... And a these uh, panels allow us to have moments of intimacy throughout the, the show, closing the cross views and allowing you to spend more time in each um, part without creating rooms. So 
At this time, we've been making a lot of exhibition design. Uh, we did a lot of uh, projects that we didn't actually build. This was for a museum underwater. Um, we start uh, testing our carpenter also, like doing replicas of chairs we liked, uh, doing furniture for offices, uh, doing um, research in drawings. This is a series of uh, vernacular houses in Mediterranean in a, some book I found. And redrawing them in axonometric, uh, Egyptian axonometric. So try to define when I was drawing outside or when I was drawing inside. Um, this is like a regular uh, meeting in, in our office uh, and some other models we would like to show and back in the yard we can see it just. Uh, These are Jessica and Selina. This was you? about one year after moving to, to our office. We are still a four people office. So we were approaching all scales, like furniture as architecture and architecture as furniture. And the small scale projects allow us to, as I was saying, to experiment more and to test out concepts and ideas. And I think it was the first time we had like uh, more projects at the same time. So doing the same scale models and drawings helped us to actually realize in which size we were uh, thinking. Uh, the this is the, the biggest thing we had had so far. So, uh, well, this is our also drawings for furniture. This is like uh, past year, a little bit more um, having more ideas. This, this was supposed to be a, a, a dining table that it's uh, actually activated without the, the human. So when the human uses it, it breaks it, it breaks it. So it has like a certain way of dealing with the non-use. There is also an exhibition design we did in, in Argentina where each curatorial project also converged into the center. Uh, two years ago, we were one of the winners of the Architectural League Prize for Young Architects. We are very grateful to the League for having supported us to do actually a piece of architecture inside the gallery. This means that mainly all the other winners arrived with ready-made, very nice things. They were a very nice bunch of people. And we spent three days covering white paint, trying to build this curvy wall inside uh, that blend in with the walls of the gallery and inside of which we built five dioramas depicting our work. Yeah, the main idea was to, to erase the architecture from the exposition and not to be one more piece. So at once, when you got into the, went to the room, you couldn't see the piece. And after a little bit of curiosity, you, you approximate to the, to the curvy wall and actually see the dioramas. The dioramas are placed in the regional orientation, so the curvy wall responds to that um, matter. It was also a political issue at that time because Trump was elected and the wall was uh, starting to gain attention. So you actually were crossing the, the, the border or the wall to, to see the, the work we did in Mexico. So we're going to keep showing some other photos. So this is a, a table that we wanted to start drawing in elevation. We didn't want to start drawing a, any plan floor for the table. It's a, it's a table for 26 people. The client is also a client tattoo. A tattoo uh, yeah. So while I was tattooing him, he mentioned that he was going to have his second anniversary and he rented a gallery. So I was like, clean space, big table, let's do the table. And just um, we played with the with the optical illusion of having different um, heights for the table and different relationships to it. The office after two years, uh, we kept experimenting with the different materials, different shapes of the same thing, and I mean. This idea of variations. furniture that is activated by the user, and the next step towards a medium size installation that it's actually a, a group of spinning panels. At one point, we earned the FONCA grant. So in Mexico, we have like 400 of these police stations. They were built in the 80s. They were supposed to, to 
to work for surveillance or to call an ambulance or a fire for any emergency. Right now they're like underused. So we redraw all of them. There was no information. We drew the map and tried to transform them into public infrastructure, having a water tanks or small libraries or compost, uh, urban compost uh, centers or even playgrounds. There were at the end, there's the 16 typologies we have in Mexico where we're shown at the SF MoMA near to the, to the table they built. Uh, at the end of last year, we had a collaboration for the first time with other three architects, To and Alberto Deris, inspired by this idea of equilibrium in Mexico City in between water and built mass. We erected this pavilion with earth blocks, um, done with just with a pressure machine or on a pond. Uh, the, the walls are three feet thick, but still they are transparent through the holes, so, so this contradiction is very present. This was one year after the earthquake uh, from last year. So the, this material, we, the money we got to do the pavilion, we used it to buy the blocks and then use the pavilion as a, just a, an a passing through, an excuse to, to, to buy the blocks and then send them to the community center to, to continue building it. So this material is gonna be used at Oquilan, this small uh, town for a community center. The blocks are uh, just simplemente uh, apoyados. There is no concrete or anything. And those, they become very liquid. The, the workers just put them, and after one week, they just grabbed them and took it to, another, to, the, to the truck again to send them to we're, the final destination. We're almost there. So uh, just to uh, finish, um, there are projects that we haven't managed to materialize and they keep coming back until we have the chance. So for years, this small uh, library pavilion has accompanied us and now we hope to build it uh, in Sao Paulo. Thank you. Okay, Martin Jankok and Michal Janak were the first being today in the morning here. So, <laughs> this is your moment. <laughs> they were 8.30, they were. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been really a pleasure and uh, all these days, like it's wonderful. Also, thank you very much all the speakers. Uh, so uh, uh, we're called Plural. Uh, we are from Bratislava, which is in Slovakia, uh, in Central Europe. Uh, it's uh, capital of Slovakia, 60 kilometers uh, uh, from Vienna, approximately. We are a small studio of uh, three people, sometimes four, depending on the collaboration, but the core is uh, three. Uh, uh, Martin established the studio 10 years ago, and I joined in 2013, so there is a kind of a generational gap between us, which is uh, interesting, and also that's uh, uh, what influences us in a way. But uh, we will also talk about uh, our kind of uh, preconditions of our work uh, as we are in this theory block, and it's uh, difficult uh, for us because uh, when we are talking about it we uh, thought like okay uh, if it's from theory to practice maybe for us it's more from practice to theory as we are now more engaged in academia uh, I'm, st I'm doing the PhD in uh, Faculty of Architecture in Bratislava and we also started to more theorize uh, the, our environment uh, especially the, the Bratislava as a city because uh, we uh, have been fascinated by it, and uh, we have been fascinated by it as a condition that uh, is not uh, usually seen as pleasant or good, or is seen as something that has to be changed. Uh, this is a project by a collective VAL, which was a artistic architectural collective in the 60s and the 70s, consisting of a conceptual artists and two architects. Uh, uh, and this is what uh, they produced. They produced uh, these uh, projects uh, uh, of, uh, that would kind of reflect the, the architecture of that time uh, in a way that uh, 
these were the monumental projects and uh, it also shows that uh, perhaps this could have been possible in that time in Bratislava. Uh, Bratislava, it's interesting for, because it's a product of 20th century. Before it didn't exist as, uh, as it is existing now. Uh, it has been basically con colonized by Czechoslovakia after the First World War. And uh, since then it has been uh, rapidly urbanized and so it doesn't have this kind of a uh, classical tradition or, or tradition of classical urbanism and it doesn't have, still doesn't have this kind of an image of itself. It doesn't know what it wants to be or it sees itself as something completely different uh, than it really is. So all these kind of uh, regimes in 20th century, all these uh, new ideas of what the city should be like, uh, ex uh, came to the city as a tabula rasa and tried to override it. So also the Theoreticians and historians uh, called it unplanned, planned city because so much of in the city was planned but uh, uh, was put together in a more unplanned way. Uh, this is the map we did as uh, our endeavor in uh, uh, trying to uh, document what uh, Bratislava is. Uh, we call it Projekt Bratislava. And two years ago, we conducted a workshop with students and we tried to do this morphological st study where we would uh, uh, try to draw how we see Bratislava. So you can see this kind of a different island of uh, different urban conditions and we deleted uh, the areas which are more uh, mixed and uh, this is how you see uh, actually also perceive Bratislava as some kind of a very discontinuous conditions of uh, artifacts of uh, of islands that collide in certain areas, and they are of various uh, uh, urban ideas and are also various sizes. You can see, yeah. for instance, you can see the modernistic uh, estates, the huge modernistic estates uh, on the outskirts. Uh, it, there is not the whole Bratislava. Actually, the Bratislava has a footprint of Vienna, even though the population is maybe one quarter. Uh, this is one of the largest modernistic estates in uh, Europe. Uh, it has all, almost 200,000 inhabitants. It was built uh, in the 70s and the 80s. And all, this is the core of Bratislava, like what was in before the First World War. Bratislava was only this. So you can see it expanded rapidly. And until 1970s, it didn't have actually any kind of a regulation plan of uh, how it would expand. So it would uh, expand very dynamically and uh, speculatively in a way, even though it was planned. So you can see it in this sketch of uh, one of the most uh, important architects, uh, Stefan Svetko. And uh, here you can see various artifacts of uh, projects which were not built, but they were planned to be built in the 70s or 80s, and he put it down and also that this is a story of Bratislava that so many of these projects were planned and but only fragments of them have been implemented such as this transversal axis which is which is uh, pink and he proposed the various projects on this axis uh, here only one has been uh, built is the famous inverted pyramid uh, but also other public facilities built and buildings were to be placed there so first the regulation was put uh, only one building was built and then nothing else was built so it created this kind of a tension and uh, very complex situation as could be also seen for instance here which is a different situation in the uh, center of Bratislava and you can see blue foam is the structure from the 19th century and then the white foam is the department store from the 60s and uh, the orange foam is proposed regulations from 10 years ago. And you can see like uh, even the, despite all the power of, of the government back then, it was not possible to implement the idea of the modernistic uh, complex uh, in its fullness. Like you can see the situation being kind of awkward and complex. So this is uh, our environment and it, uh, uh, this is also how uh, we are perceiving the architecture because we are from this environment as uh, something that is more free and but uh, also that can uh, allow certain complexities uh, uh, out of uh, autonomous architecture. So uh, this is uh, the continuation of our research project. We 
uh, mapped uh, actually the outskirt of uh, Petrojalka, the, the, the largest modernistic estate. And we've seen that on the perimeter actually it's being uh, uh, occupied by uh, new structures. And uh, along this ring, uh, certain new linear city is becoming to be. So there, there are these kind of a inverted uh, situations where, where not the total ideas are not implemented in the fullness and also uh, the in-between spaces are being uh, occupied. Um, we documented it in this Ed Russia way and also in video and uh, photography and others. You can see it here. So a very complex situation on the outskirt and it uh, complements the Petrozalka in a way that uh, it's uh, all that the modernistic estate isn't. So perhaps that's why uh, our position as architects is uh, something uh, that we see ourselves in a position of uh, this kind of instability uh, and uh, we have this kind of a tendency to use the minimal means to, to do the maximum like, uh, and to use the form, perhaps monumental and very specific form in this kind of a very unstable situation to, to establish certain relationships as is seen for instance on certain exhibitions designs. Or for instance in our proposal for uh, and project for the uh, bookshop which we've seen as uh, something, uh, even though it was a bookshop and it, it uh, was uh, an interior, the, the, it was something public. So also the form had to address this kind of a publicity and so we used this monumental form of uh, staircase uh, to, to make it, uh, to signify the publicity and also to, to signify it as a, as a point on, of the map. Also, what we see ourselves uh, is perhaps represented in this image uh, of Bruce Neumann, the dance on the, or exercise on the perimeter or square. It's uh, establishing this uh, basic uh, relationships by architecture uh, of, uh, we see it inher inherently as something public and by very specific form, we can uh, address something that is very uncertain and unpredictable. As could be seen in this uh, project, uh, it was a summer pavilion for Slovak National Gallery. And you can see all this uh, complex situation here where the, actually the, the gallery is a Renaissance uh, courtyard building uh, with the uh, new addition from the 1960s, a very monumental one. It's, so it's creating this uh, open courtyard and uh, the Slovak National Gallery wanted to do a program there uh, during the summer, but uh, the space was, uh, the space needed some kind of a definition, but a formal definition. So by the minimal means of, of this uh, spatial grid, uh, the, the space of the, the courtyards was measured, as you can see here in red, and it allowed to establish certain possibilities of a program to happen there. Um, quite frequently we use uh, references to discuss uh, certain ideas, uh, spatial ideas basically, uh, but also to relate uh, ourselves uh, to, or our work to relate to the history of uh, architecture. We are not uh, scholars, so we work with it uh, in a kind of a naive way where we um, basically strip uh, the, the reference or the, the pre precedence uh, to its basic essence and we use it as some kind of a guiding principle uh, throughout uh, our projects or throughout the, the preparation but also uh, later by explaining our project. Uh, for example here we were fascinated by the uh, this in-between space uh, by Karl Friedrich Schinkel and it became uh, some kind of a uh, image or some, some kind of a, what we wanted to achieve with uh, this house uh, uh, in a house that uh, we did a couple of years ago and um, 
and there was a certain need to uh, maintain a delicate relationship between the, the plot, the garden, and the house. So the house was set back uh, from the street line, uh, and it was surrounded by it's another part of, of it called Outer House. And this, this, this way we created some kind of in-between space that uh, is neither a house and neither a garden, but it's some kind of uh, mediator between these two environments. And so, so we can say that it, uh, it's a question of uh, privacy, but it also uh, um, somehow questions the uh, traditional dichotomy of uh, the interior and exterior of house and uh, garden. Uh, but it was also a pragmatic, uh, this division of program into uh, inner house and outer house was also uh, pragmatic. Uh, we wanted to be very uh, effective, so we comprised all the basic dwelling program of the house into a very uh, compact uh, volume um, of the inner house, uh, which is quite a moderate size of uh, 12 by 12 meters, so it's not a big house. But we, by enclosing it into some kind of extension called the outer house, uh, uh, it gains a new quality, or the, uh, we, we somehow were able to, to, to uh, work with this contemporary paradox that we architects have to be extremely effective or uh, cost uh, effective. But at the same time, we would like to achieve some kind of a generosity or spatial experience. So in this sense, we were able to or at least we think we were able to uh, achieve a, a very uh, clear formal plan, but also a very diverse one. And uh, the interesting thing about this is that uh, you have uh, basically the same rooms in all the corners, but uh, the way they are open towards the outer house and the, the, the space in front of the window, the, the part of the outer house, which is once a patio and then some kind of a narrow corridor and then some kind of a terrace that opens towards the garden, uh, makes uh, each of the rooms uh, unique in a way. Um, another symptomatic thing uh, in uh, Slovakia is that the public authorities, the state uh, and the cities, they try somehow to uh, uh, avoid uh, taking care of the of uh, the public program or the public buildings somehow trying to uh, so they're somehow unable to find a proper use to it this is also the case in uh, Zilina where there is a synagogue uh, which the city gave back to the Jewish community uh, uh, but uh, the, the community is so uh, small and weak now in, uh, in Zelina that it's not, uh, it's not possible for them to take care about this building. So they made a call to use this uh, uh, building and uh, we have become initiators uh, or we have become part of initiators to, uh, of uh, the renewal of this building together with uh, uh, a group of uh, public enthusiasts from the same city that uh, have already the, some kind of uh, cultural center there. And uh, we have initiated this process of uh, uh, transformation of the synagogue into a new cultural space in the, in the city. By the way, the building was designed by the famous German architect uh, Peter Behrens. Uh, it's uh, almost unknown, only a few experts on his architecture know about it. Um, the, the process was uh, for us something completely new. Uh, there was no funds, there was no plan, uh, there was, uh, it was based on voluntary work, it was based on uh, small donations and small grants. And uh, there was a lot of uh, people involved who tried to somehow define the way it will work or how it should, uh, should work. There was no uh, uh, co uh, coherent construction documents. So it was a complete uh, insecurity in a way. For us architects that uh, usually or uh, traditionally we, we are maybe trained or used to environment that we can control things, it uh, could be really frustrating. So we had no other choice but to find other strategies or find other ways to, to deal with this situation. So we decided to uh, selectively or uh, 
productively lose our control and uh, we had to learn what to choose uh, or what is important for us and what we have to keep uh, under our control on what, what can be just left for uh, the others to to finish or to to, to, um, to contribute. Uh, as this might seem a disadvantage, it also has uh, one big advantage uh, that is time, which is the luxury that uh, not many of us have all, uh, today. And um, we used it in some kind of uh, uh, real-time testing of uh, different spatial ideas for for the for the building. Uh, we, we called it pre-openings. It was basically uh, once in a, in a while the, during the construction process and the, the, the gradual uh, process of transforming the building, we, we opened it for the public. There was exhibition or there was uh, some kind of a special event. And uh, it was not only good for us to, to test the, the architectural uh, solution, uh, to make it grow only into extents that are somehow appropriate for for the particular place and uh, particular context, uh, but it was also good to uh, make the the whole initiative more visible for the public to uh, acknowledge that there is something happening there and to really start to believe that this could really happen because it's like a, this kind of uh, a project is kind of. Uh, in terms of its uh, of the importance of the building, of the size of the of the building, or of the investment, it's kind of unprecedented thing, uh, unprecedented thing in uh, Slovakia, maybe in whole Central Europe. Uh, what we learned about the building uh, through time when we worked with it uh, is that in a quite short time of its existence, it's like less than 90 years, probably. Uh, it changed its uh, uh, its uh, its use numerous times. Uh, first, it was a synagogue. Uh, then later, during the Second World War, it was used as a uh, silo for grain, as a storage. Then later, it was it was rebuilt into a theater. And then later, it used as an aula of university. And later, as a cinema. So, what was fascinating for us was that. Uh, this building was able to to sustain all these uh, changes in a way that it didn't it didn't damage it uh, in a way that wouldn't be re reversible. So uh, this uh, in to, to use uh, Aldo Rossi's terminology, this propelling monument is something that is some kind of uh, uh, example for us that uh, this is like kind of architecture that we are really interested in and we would like also to do uh, in uh, in future so something that is able to 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 survive in the end uh, the 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 final uh, design is quite simple it was just uh, dividing the the space uh, into a, a, a wide, half wide gallery and half uh, synagogue. It's, it's divided in the, horizontally in the center of the space and the, the, the bottom part is uh, used for uh, events and exhibitions and the, uh, the upper part it's, serves as a presentation of the, of the building itself. Uh, but uh, it has been a, a, an, a very interesting uh, experience uh, for us, and we we learned a lot uh, about uh, control, about uh, uh, the need for a certain openness of the project, which in which learned us that that uh, something that we also do with other projects now, and that is that we we, we need to keep uh, in mind that our project have have to be uh, open at every uh, stage of. Uh, of the design, then later construction, and later uh, its use and uh, post occupancy, etc. So, in a way, maybe we can say that with these experiences, we have somehow learned to uh, enjoy this uh, insecurity. So, thank you very much. Uh, the the beauty of the work, the quality of it, how cheerful it is. Uh, also, what's the concern that all of you have with the, the places where you're working, either the cities in which you're working, uh, but also the societies uh, that you're part of and even the environments. Uh, there's always references in all cases to, for instance, the economy 
and what's the way that you're making the best of the resources, limited resources you have to work with. There's a uh, concern that often cross uh, your presentations about variability. What is the way that you can introduce uh, heterogeneity in a uh, dynamic that is uh, simplifying what the cities are about materially, uh, aesthetically. Uh, there's also a kind of a concern of or kind of uh, something that cross all the presentations in a bit. It's a cer certain bitterness about your limited, uh, the limited s slot that you're given to work. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, it's part of the, the task of being now a practitioner that uh, we are all facing a uh, moment in which basically there's not that much of a uh, demand of what we do, but still there's great efforts in uh, occupying a space and the results are really meaningful and, and, and game changing in the places where you're working. But I would like to start with uh, a change in the context. That is quite something that uh, it's very important in shaping all your trajectories. Many of you come basically from Europe or work in Europe or are shaped by European traditions and that's something that somehow poses a question of what's the way practice is changing. In uh, many cases, the people that you refer to as your antecedents are people that work in a very different context. They had public commissions, they, had, uh, they were successful in competitions because competitions were something else than what they are now. Uh, uh, but also societies were very different, they were facing different dynamics. Cities were not that much uh, shaped by investors, international investors, like dynamics were very different. When we break down that, uh, it's, it feels that uh, you're talking of things like Erasmus programs, uh, the fact that you've been living in many different places, that you have the opportunity to do research. Like somehow you're, uh, you had opportunities that previous generations never had, but somehow when it comes to practice, the uh, space you're given is much narrower. Uh, you're basically not finding that many opportunities to work in the public sector. There's not that many kind of uh, commissions that have to do with the expansion of welfare state, public space, public institutions. Uh, uh, and somehow I find that there's a, uh, a difficulty, a very specific difficulty on being trained in traditions like uh, Aldo Rossi. Uh, and having Aldo Rossi or CISA as a reference, uh, but then having to work for private clients with the smaller commissions that are driven mostly by economy. So maybe this is something that we have to address because this is a, kind of a, a, an articulation that you're all dealing with, the need of some sort of take a tradition that was built on base of the kind of celebration of societies, equalitarian societies, uh, welfare state, uh, uh, the capacity of architecture to, to build a space of commons, and then you're, and you have to bring that into commissions that are mainly private housing, or uh, gardens, or uh, commercial uh, uh, architecture, and for me, that's something that is very, very exciting. I, I must say that it's a huge endeavor and a very valuable one. So maybe we can start with this. I think we live in a different time, not only because we have different opportunities, but because we also need to share them with many more architects than the previous <laughs> architects had to do before. So the fact that nowadays, uh, at least in Portugal, the number of architects per capita is huge. So the kind of works that maybe at a certain time in history uh, would be easily spread by the few architects that were practicing. Uh, now with the lowering of uh, public investment and the increase of number of architects makes us, force us to be a bit more um, flexible in what we do or what we accept and trying to find other kind of work mm -hmm. because the perfect time where an architect was the hero of the city doesn't really exist anymore. 
Um, so I think it's really about adapting to the conditions we have. Mm -hmm. It's I don't know if we can actually change the fact that there are no public commissions, so what can we do with the private ones? Mm -hmm. It's also maybe that maybe this could be the reason why we are more interested in an open architecture that uh, perhaps is built for a private client, but in uh, 50 or 100 years it could become public. Uh, mm -hmm. You never know. So maybe that subconsciously that's why we are interested in this uh, architecture, not very specific for one use, but uh, being open to other ones. Uh, yeah. And also being uh, somehow interested in, well, each project, being uh, public or private, has uh, certain aspects that are more collective, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why maybe we are interested in, in those uh, aspects of those projects, even if they are built for pr uh, private clients. Mm -hmm. In our case, because we are the ones based in Latin America, maybe our case is a bit different. Because in Mexico, at least, there are many things that need to be done, much mm -hmm. more than in Europe somehow. This is generalizing, but I hope you understand me. And despite there are no, not many public commissions, people have the feeling that they have to do their th the things on their own because they've been doing mm -hmm. it like that since ever. So young architects have the opportunity at least to do things, no matter the scale. But I have the feeling that we are always doing things. It can be a table, it can be a house. We usually only show things that are ready and materialized, so we haven't brought um, designs for housing buildings, something we're trying to get into. But uh, because of having been educated in Europe and uh, based in Latin America, I really see this huge gap in between what you are able to do in places in which uh, constraint are, constraints are much higher, like Europe or the States, and in uh, places like Latin America in which things are much more uh, free, organic, self-done. Um, I guess Alessandra's the <laughs> Mexican part of Lanza can talk about it better, but this is my opinion. <laughs> I do believe we have uh, three personalities in <laughs> Lanza, like the private, the public, and the, and the contest the free the free one no so the private one you always deal with a with a client that shows you a bunch of internet images so that's kind of uh, annoying i mean it leads you to somewhere but at the end you just don't want to see anything about that and you have the public clients that they have more money and they're not so apprehensive about the space you're going to make no and, <laughs> and in this case we have the um, the opportunity to make ephemeral um architecture that in our way of seeing it and or, or understanding it, um, it's the most um, uh, permanent one because mm -hmm. of the how do you register the the things that are happening now, and the contest. Now that, as you say, I, I truly don't know which projects are the one that win uh, pavilions right now. No, what, <laughs> what kind of thinking behind the architecture is the leading? Um, ways of doing, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would like to add just two, two small details. The first detail is that um, even while doing the smallest piece of architecture, example, a house for a bird, mm -hmm. the I think architects should always look up, you know, and bringing Cisa and Rossi and yeah. Shinohara, etc., to discuss a birdhouse, it's somehow an insult, but they don't know about <laughs> it, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> And um, the second thing is that I think there's a lot of um, we call we talk about a lot a lot about ecology and sustainability yeah. these days, and there's a certain sustainability in understanding that what today so let's say we don't have the commissions mm -hmm. that those architects had 20, 50, 60 years ago, but we have a lot of commissions now that those architects would not do at all. Yeah. So maybe what is happening now is that we are the young practices of today, they have the opportunity to create a model that maybe in 50 years yeah. is going to be again in this uh, in this uh, innuendo somehow. Yeah. Uh, a, a big part of the audience here is an audience that uh, will graduate soon, for instance, will start their practice. 
uh, in the next months, weeks, or uh, think of doing it, thinking of doing it maybe. Uh, in, one thing that crossed your presentation is that for me it's, a, it's something of the time, but, but in, a very, in, a, in a way it's very productive in all your practices. It's a mixture of optimism and kind of not optimism. <laughs> Uh, a mixture of kind of being very aware of what's going on in the world, but also being happy to having the opportunity to do things. Uh, this is something that uh, somehow is the engine and is fueling many of the independent practices that, as you, uh, Philippe said, uh, are very much contributing to uh, bring our discipline into criticality, making it uh, politically active, so maybe we can refer to this kind of maybe stupid thing, but in my opinion, quite serious of how to be optimistic at the same time being not optimistic and knowing what's going on in the world. I, I, I would still say, I, I mean, I don't know where we're going to be in 20 years from now or 50 years from now, but I doubt that, in, that we will say more with the projects we will do at that time, assuming that we yeah. grow somehow, than what we say today with the small commissions we have now. I think there's a, there's a level of effort and sweat and passion that we have, and an energy that we have that probably comes with the age, uh, that I, or that we might lose with the with the with the years, that uh, I think makes every of these very small jewelry boxes we are asked yeah. to do much more special than maybe you know what the big architects are doing today. <laughs> we enjoy more architecture than Norman Foster. This is a fact. There's no 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 discussion. I would just dare to add my favorite quote of Franz Kafka that there is infinite hope in the universe, but not for us. Uh, so, uh, so, so maybe this, this uh, kind of uh, contradictory uh, situation is just uh, needed and it's not possible to somehow overcome it or it, it's not even uh, desirable, I think. Uh, we, we still need all both these or all these forces to somehow negotiate to, to continue to produce. I think that the bitterness you're referring to comes from this idea of the architect in a role in which he or her or yeah. she wants to do more than he or she's asked for. But this is a positive driving force for me. And there's also the um, joy and the fun of trying to subvert what you're given and do much more trying to cheat or to tease the situation and often much more. And uh, the pleasure of finding a material, the pleasure of designing a detail, the pleasure of seeing something flat become something in 3D yeah. exists in any kind of um, project. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we decided a long time ago that as long as we were having fun at this, we will continue. and. That, that was the main goal. Yeah, and taking advantage of architects right now is understanding that it's completely free. So yes. there are no rules. I mean, we have gravity, we have clients, but we also can play with those very much, no? Come on, yeah. to have freedom. Yeah, I think it's, um, if we think about that, it's a bit hard to be an architect nowadays, or a bit harder, let's say, if we don't have fun in what we do, it's going to be even worse. So mm. I think it's more about that we really need to enjoy what we are doing so that ev all the other boring parts or things that we would like to change but we can't uh, are not so important and so heavy. And for example, yeah. the first time like w the house that Philip showed with the tower, with, with the pink triangles, only when it was really built and painted, it was like, this really happened. And that moment is very special and very yeah. important. And we think all the work we had until then, it was worth it because we see things happening. So I think the optimism is, but at the same time realizing that reality is reality and we need to face it. But it's easier if we enjoy uh, mm -hmm. doing it so but mm -hmm. we need to remember that there are problems and things that we cannot change uh, in the daily life mm -hmm. of an architect 
And I think also the architecture lives in the drawings and in the models. I mean, you don't have to build it um, always, no? So, yeah. and actually it's important that you don't build everything you're thinking or uh, projecting because so five years later you actually realize that it was, uh, it was a mistake, the idea yeah. you had, no? Come on. So I'm glad that architecture can live in the paper also, no? And, yeah. and, you, all, and you get used to it. And, to have the, those ideas always floating in the office and mixing around and then you have another that is gonna get built. So you just have to leave your own world and try to mm -hmm. express it when you're able to. Yeah, but I have, I'm sorry, sorry go ahead. Uh, our partner, partner Hamid, he often says like, um, maybe architecture should be a little bit like, um, uh, like the youth. Uh, like being an adult, uh, adolescent, like yeah. if we don't, if a teenager, if you don't regret anything that you've done before, maybe you didn't do it <laughs> properly. So it's uh, sometimes good to regret a few of the things that you've done. It means that you grew somehow, I think. I was going to say that the magical thing about going a step forward towards materializing something, and this is the, um, lovely thing I found about this very particular symposium that it's about constructing is that when you start building, you engage with different actors that you haven't been related to at the academia or at the studio in between architects. So you start talking with people from different <coughs> disciplines, different professions, different tasks. And that's also a very joyful moment in which yes. you gain some um, acceptance. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think also it's uh, it's essential to look at the situation and find uh, certain aspects that could be um, that you, you you can play w in your in your favor. You know, in yep. the, yeah, that uh, you work with what you have and uh, find uh, some beauty in it. Uh, but uh, there are limits, of course, and yep. uh, it's uh, like. Uh, I love the, the last uh, chapter of uh, Architecture of the City, where like even Rossi says that, uh, yeah, uh, architecture never can be avant-garde. You have to use politics to change mm -hmm. the city. So I think like all of us should be more political, if be architects or doctors or uh, lawyers, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we all should be more political as citizens and to, in order to change the city and the problems. But in a way, all of you, are facing huge political uh, disputes. Uh, in every single presentation, there was a moment in which you were referring to a situation that is very political and that is uh, broadly disputed, uh, not only in the places where you're working, but globally. Uh, maybe this is a, an opportunity to get a little bit more in detail. Uh, for instance, and I, I would like to refer to some of the moments of each presentation in which I think that you're facing big things and of course, you didn't have the time to get in depth, so maybe that's the moment, because those limits can be probably be explored there, and what's the capacity for you to theorize on that and also to build a position through your design. So for instance, when you were talking about uh, uh, Bratislav and uh, the, the way the city is evolving, you were talking uh, of many difficulties that have to do with, uh, with who's gaining agency in those transformations, what's the impossibility of architects in many ways to affect that, what's the way uh, global capital is affecting places like Bratislava or Slovakia at large or Europe at large, I would say. So maybe this is something that you can explain a little bit how you negotiate without, how, how you basically position yourself and what's the, what is that that you can do through your uh, work on that? For instance, in your case, uh, Isabella and Alessandro, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a similar way to, to Michal and, and Martin, you're also facing with uh, the fact that, for instance, water in Mexico City is a huge dispute that is producing inequality, it's, uh, it's very much dividing society, uh, and you're working with that. Also, you were talking about taxes when it came to design this particular gallery to show the artworks that artists are giving us payment for the taxes. So you were also touching something that is crucial in Mexico and uh, it's in the heart of inequality. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's the way you could, you could really intervene those realities through design and what's the way you conceptualize and position yourself through your work. And in your case, you were talking, for instance, of 
Porto, and the way Porto it's been totally transformed uh, by gentrification, but a very particular kind of gentrification that comes together probably with the fact that Portugal is attracting capital through tax uh, uh, incentives, and that is becoming this uh, part of, like many other places in Europe, that is becoming sort of, a, 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 maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but an in onshore, offshore location, and that's happening through architecture and through the value that historical architecture, as you very well explained, happens. So all of you are kind of, your projects are pulsing the capacity of architecture to conceptualize, to take position, uh, to think of the way design is part of huge disputes, political disputes, but also disputes that are calling for new ways of thinking about the uh, agency of architectural practices and also about the way we understand uh, what's the way uh, the materiality of architecture uh, is part of larger discussions and larger dynamics. So maybe w we can do a little bit of a round in which you tell us a little bit more of how you dealt with this, what is the way you found your architecture could uh, find ways to be part of that and to I make a change there or not, and what's the way that you could position yourself through your work in this particular political and kind of cultural, political, social, environmental disputes. Maybe you want, Mihail and Martin, you want to start. Yeah, maybe I will start and Mikhail will continue. Um, right now, or it's in almost the last 20 years uh, in Slovakia, uh, most of the cities uh, are shaped by a private sector. It's almost 100%. Uh, state is not investing. Uh, if it is, it is uh, really like in a small percentage of the whole uh, uh, amount of the, of, the, uh, of the city fabric. Uh, this is actually, and, and it's like 10 offices that uh, that do build the, the whole Bratislava. So it's uh, it's very homogeneous. It's yeah. very, I would say, uh, wash, washed out almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's like a thing that we cannot somehow that there is no discourse. And uh, even if it if there was some discourse on this level, we wouldn't be able to participate because uh, no one is interested in what we think about it, mm -hmm. or no one calls us for some kind of. An, an, as you saw, there there is no. Uh, we don't have any residential pro uh, project mm -hmm. of no, no collective housing. Yep. And for for example, if you compare it to the northern or western part of Europe, it's like the collective housing is kind of a big issue, and it's supported also by this uh, uh, many times by the state. Uh, uh, so what we did uh, is also what Michal showed uh, is that we did some kind of our personal research or a reading of the city to uh, to somehow define it and to to pose questions uh, we we did a workshop and then we did an exhibition and this this way we try to somehow uh, make our uh, points legitimate or uh, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to 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 gain some uh, 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 strength and to be a voice uh, mm -hmm. in a way but it's like in the process i would say right now I don't know. Mm -hmm. yes well we are trying to take advantage of the situation that the city is small and uh, almost uh, everyone knows everyone. Mm -hmm. So if you say something that uh, has a s that uh, is uh, of a relevance, that uh, it's uh, mo then most possibly you are also hurt. So we are trying to mm -hmm. take advantage of it, but uh, we also uh, want to do it step by step and really. Uh, analyze the city in a way that uh, we intuitively know uh, what do we like about the city and how, what do we like about the condition that is seen as uh, disadvantages. Uh, uh, most of the people think that uh, it's, it's uh, bad that Bratislava doesn't have an identity or such an image of itself. Uh, we think of it as a, as a quality, <laughs> that uh, there is this kind of instability, that there is no, n there is no this kind of a, uh, identity of, uh, okay, Bratislava is this, and we can uh, then capitalize on that. No, it's like, it's still an open uh, mm -hmm. kind of an identity. So, uh, yeah. I just wanted to say that it's often, it's uh, it's pointed out that uh, Bratislava wants to be like Vienna or like, like mm -hmm. Prague, but it's not possible. <laughs> it's basically not possible that the fabric is not there anymore, or it never have been there. Uh, so it's a completely different, uh, uh, substance, yeah. I would say. Uh, yeah, we love how rough it is, how uh, discontinuous it is, and uh, and we see it as a potentially as a model for uh, 
metropolis in 21st century uh, with its uh, morphological diversity of the co complexity it offers. So uh, we want to build on that and perhaps build some kind of a theoretic model on that, but uh, we are still uh, use it as a something to read. But uh, I think that's what it is. It's essential to see all these disadvantages as uh, possibilities to, to for something better. Yeah. So referring to the water issue, which I think it's uh, so important in mainly in a city that's like Mexico City. Of course, when uh, when the Europeans arrived, the Spanish arrived, they found a system of interconnected lakes that was Tenochtitlan, and they slowly start to dry them out, out of hygienical reasons, but of also out of ignorance, and century after century, the city started losing and losing more lakes. But the, the very deep problem arose uh, in, in the 19th century and 20th century when the underground aquifers start to be exploited so much that actually the city uh, accelerated its sinking. Today, you have points in the, uh, in the city sinking as much as from 40 centimeters till one meter, so from two feet till five feet, which is mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, Venice is sinking like two millimeters a year. Yep. I mean, <laughs> Mexico is sinking one meter a year. It's, it's really crazy. So to mend this situation, you need such a political um, engagement and in, from the engineer point of view. But what, what we can help more to as architects, I, I think it's in the educational point of view. So we try to keep on writing articles being kind of engaged with receiving students or lecturing and communicating. And of course, the, um, the pavilion, uh, the communi community center pavilion we did with, to with to and Alberto Dade attracts attention on this very specific issue of the water. But it's such a huge issue and it's involving so many factors that uh, architects <laughs> need uh, like more people involved. And trying to maybe to be a bit more optimistic, I'd like to say that the, the story behind the taxes, um, the tax collection, the treasury collection, uh, it, which begins uh, 40, 50 years ago, when some artist friend of uh, Siqueiros, uh, one of the very important muralists, uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros and Diego Rivera, was uh, sent to prison because he couldn't pay his taxes. And Siqueiros suggested to the Minist uh, ministry that artists could should pay should be able to pay their taxes with mm -hmm. artwork. So in a way, and maybe regarding Mexico as a young democracy mm -hmm. from a European point of view, I have the feeling that if you come up with a very brilliant idea that is gonna that isn't gonna cost money to the government, mm -hmm. somehow you can be listened. Consistency, uh, resistance, <laughs> and try to keep the, the, the things you want to do and not go to the floor. I mean, may, the, most of my colleagues actually want to build uh, housing uh, developments or make money with architecture or being an architect uh, means to build whatever, no? Uh, <laughs> Um, sorry, I lost the word. What I'm trying to say is that um, when things when things get uh, actually rough with some client that you want, sorry, I lost the idea. Please, you keep on. And <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> um, so in Portugal, it's a bit different than Mexico. <laughs> Um, the main problem that we are facing right now in Portugal, or it, it is a problem, but it was also a very good thing. Mm -hmm. So Portugal was in a very, very big, and Europe in general, but I think Portugal even more than the rest, uh, was in a very big crisis. Nothing was happening. Um, the prices went super low of everything, but even with the prices being super low, nobody was actually being able to buy anything. Mm -hmm. uh, even banks were not giving loans to private people, so it, it was a very complicated moment. And we actually decided to come back when there was still a crisis on, so mm -hmm. of course, I don't know why. <laughs> um, yeah. But then we were lucky 
that suddenly a, port, a series of um, changes in laws and uh, opening the investor the, in the country for uh, in for outside investments um, everything happened a little bit at the same time and everything started to develop a little bit too fast and not controlled so for example it was the golden visas program um, it was the fact that the north of Africa was super unstable Portugal was in the corner very safe nobody cares about it so <laughs> it was a safe spot to go um, um, they also changed a lot of laws in Portugal regarding uh, refurbishment. So, for example, uh, until 2014, we were forced to, if we would want to do whatever works in an old building, to incorporate all the handicap accessibility mm -hmm. lift. Uh, and it was basically impossible to do it in the typical plot of Porto that is six meters or five meters wide by 15, 20 meters deep to put a lift and a staircase and a staircase with the dimensions of for handicap so it was literally impossible to work um, to do renovations in the city center so actually people started leaving uh, uh, so they left the city center because it was impossible to live there no schools no parking so it was almost an abandoned city um, and it was a good thing that actually the, uh, they changed some laws and people started reinvesting uh, in the city center um, to reactivate it. And it really reactivated. The problem was that it happened in three years, four years, and suddenly it's a little bit too much. And mm -hmm. the few people that never left the city center or the few people, like for example, as we went back to live in the city center before this boom happened. Um, everything started to be a little bit too expensive for the people that were already there. So um, I think the main problem was there were no regulation in time. So yeah. suddenly it was important to have money coming and investment happening and the, the economy evolving. Um, but in Lisbon it happened before, and but it took five, eight years Porto is a quarter of the size, so of course it happened much faster, and the main problem was that there was no regulation. Uh, but in terms of our work, it's a bit yeah. complicated to actually be able to help stopping uh, that problem, because if we don't do it, someone else will do it, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think as architects, sometimes we try to educate the client, but he wants to make money, and you should be able to fulfill his wish. Um, but maybe trying to make it in a way that in the future, if Airbnb collapses or there are way too many, um, actually now we don't have enough uh, student housing, so it will be transformed in student housing. So mm -hmm. it, it's not all terrible, uh, and maybe it a way of in incentivating uh, that w would be over taxes to people for long-term rentals instead of short-term term rentals to make it <coughs> financial available for it to But happen. for instance, I remember, and we can start opening it to the audience, so those that want to make questions, start raising your hands, and I will uh, help directing the micro. <laughs> but for instance, uh, you, uh, okay, you, you, uh, it, Filippo identified that there was an aesthetic uh, discussion going on in regards to how to deal with history, with references like the making of history also being selective with modern, modern, modern that or actual current that looks like uh, pretends to look old and all these things. So you were very much identifying that as a design problem and you were addressing it, right? Yes. yes. We, sorry, we do and it's, uh, it's a problem because the most powerful people in this, uh, in this chess game we play yeah. are not the clients that come from the private sector are not us that do the design, that you know we are the artists, are the people that evaluate the project. Yeah. They have 120% of the power in their hands. And sometimes we get letters saying that uh, RAL 600 and whatever, it's not harmonious. <laughs> and because of this, one year of permit process has a reset button and goes back to the beginning. And this triggers a domino effect because the client assumes we are incompetent <laughs> because what is RAL 600 and something? What is that? You failed on that. So it's our fault. 
And then we try to go there, and we try to negotiate, we try to talk, and they tell us that no, because people like old buildings, they like this, and they show us a photo of a development that was built last year looking like the 18th century architecture. And we say, no, that's not true, that's actually not the case. And you try to argue, you try to fight this, but on the other side of the, of the discussion, this is what the public sector is actually doing. But because this becomes such a norm, the private sector understands that on a subconscious level this is a thing. So they come to us and say, well, I want you to do a building for me and it needs to look like this. Mm -hmm. They already told me this is what it has to be. Mm -hmm. And this starts even getting worse. And when we try to negotiate and we try to argue, both the people that make the decision and both the people that spend the money, they are truly convinced that in 2018 we should build buildings that look like the medieval ages. Mm -hmm. This is an issue. This is a big mm -hmm. issue. And what Anna was saying is, 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 is the basis, you know, it's the, the rice and potatoes of our daily routine, which is we are put in a position where if we don't do it, trust me, someone else is going to do it and we don't get paid. And maybe I'm going out of topic here, but it's crucial, even more in an academic environment, to say this. This is a job. We need a salary at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And if we have a practice, like we have a practice of 10 people, these are 10 salaries, Portuguese salaries, low salaries, but still 10 salaries. And we get paid 4,000 euros for renovation, 7,000 euros for a single family house, including everything, engineering, site supervision, two years of work. I mean, this, this, when you join all of these nitroglycerin bottles in the same, in the same bucket, mm -hmm. you create the conditions for an explosive context. Mm -hmm. And this now it's becoming an issue because between the absolute lack of understanding of the general population towards what architects do, my parents still don't understand what I do. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that 99.99999% of the population accepts that things that look pastiche and old are okay, that's what we should do, and that we are not even properly paid in the process, mm -hmm. the real question is, why are we doing architecture? I mean, this is, this is, <laughs> a, this is a... Yeah, so some, I sorry, so just to uh, finish what Philip was saying, for example, in the building that showed with a marble facade, we found a way to trick the municipality, saying it's natural stone, they like natural stone. Uh, in the front side, uh, we changed the tiles for natural stone in the same color of the original tiles, so they accept it. So it's really trying to find a way of, if they, they can of course ask like what kind of stone, but they didn't, so we managed to do it. But only because it was in the back facade, because of course in the front facade, they checked what kind of stone we were proposing mm -hmm. and all those things. Mm -hmm. So it's, now, I just wanted to go back to the first question that Andres uh, brought on the table uh, at the beginning of the conversation. I thought that uh, was uh, really sharp and smart, and somehow, it, uh, thanks to that question also, I realized how important it is to have this kind of uh, symposiums nowadays, because clearly our references, as, as, as you were referring, Andres, our, the way that we have been educated, uh, and still nowadays our main references are of practices that uh, were raised and defined in a, in a period of time uh, which reality is so different from ours, yep. and especially in Europe. And, uh, and of course the worst thing that we can do is just to consider that that's not happening and perpetuate their way of doing, and because that's gonna be really frustrating. We clearly cannot operate anymore as they did. And uh, not only uh, how we design, but also how we communicate things, our discussions and uh, topics of interest, etc. And of course, as uh, Felipe was mentioning, in that process of, you know, in this conflict moment, at the end of the day, we have to keep on going. So maybe the, the way we do, it's defining, as Felipe mentioned, yeah a new way, mm -hmm. and uh, there's uh, some projects that clearly are uh, related with uh, new ways of doing as a uh, plural project. Those, for instance, those projects that are um, clearly collective, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then suddenly the role of the architect is uh, split and disseminated in the process, mm -hmm. which has good points because, you know, like we participate more um, in a stronger manner in the participatory process, in the design process, in the construction process, in the after construction yep. process. So suddenly the architect is more involved in, uh, in other roles, but, and I'm referring, I want to bring that back on the table because I want to ask um, not only Brutal, but also Andres' point of view, because clearly, for instance, in Spain, we have had a lot of, uh, uh, projects like that one after the crisis and, and uh, for us it has been super interesting like suddenly uh, a new way of doing was possible 
but uh, with a lot of good points, but a lot of bad points, because some of those projects substitute uh, public, uh, public projects. And, uh, and at the end of the day, one of the conse bad consequences was actually the, finance, the way th those projects were financed. So the idea of yeah. a discipline that suddenly started to be a voluntary act. So suddenly, kind of a labor of love. So we did it in a voluntary manner. And I'm seeing this because I think that still, despite those controversies that we faced in Spain, it's a, a new way of doing that I, it has a future. It has a lot of possibilities. So my question uh, to Plural is how do you what do you learn from that? Uh, that, by the way, the, the result of that project that I follow, it was, it's amazing, and I was happy to see images today. How, what do you learn from that? How do you see if you have other projects like that, or which are the, the future of those practices? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think I, I tried to, to, uh, to say that, uh, to, to say that all already in the, uh, in the presentation that uh, it's, it's certain uh, positive attitude or uh, a will to accept this unforeseen or this uh, kind of uh, insecure situation that because for, for a long time we tried to somehow fight it to somehow persuade people that uh, the way it should be it's better than uh, I don't know uh, what, what you want now and now we 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 somehow I think we learned or we are we are still learning uh, to distinguish between which the, the, this kind of a uh, productive losing of control that that you 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 keep part of the project which is extremely important which which is the essence of it and then there are parts that also uh, can be open or maybe uh, decided later maybe this postponed decision is our uh, it also makes the process very long. It, we are very, very slow in designing, which is also not a very good strategy today. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think we are trying to do uh, to to be in a way to to survive, but at the same time uh, not to be too too fast in making decisions and uh, maybe trying to uh, to see if if the design works uh, in some kind of a uh, pro uh, prototype way uh, even in the process and then then we then we when, then we do the necessary uh, decisions at the last moment of the of, of the design process i don't know if that answered but uh, uh, did you get paid for the uh, for the new synagogue project yeah. uh, Almost nothing. No, because but um, in this case uh, we went or we we entered the, the the initiative as initiators ourselves, so we didn't have any expectations of it. That was also the reason that we we had to also limit our presence at the site, uh, in also in terms of construction documents. A part of it was uh, developed uh, completely without uh, our guidance. Or I just we just saw the printed uh, stuff and uh, said, "Okay, we need to check these things later at the construction site," and then it was like re-legalized later in a, in a, some kind of a legal way that it can it's possible mm -hmm. to do it. But oh, I think a little bit related with uh, Anna said. Did you feel that the fact that it was a uh, that you as an architect were you were initiating the process? Did you feel that people looked to you uh, with respect, more respect or less respect, if you would get paid for that project in terms of an architect, commission. if it was a normal commission? Mm. Did you feel, uh, did you get treated differently? Uh, by by whom? By public or by? Uh, by whoever were because it depends there were so many client. people involved in it and everyone was not paid so it was like so it a was co co collective uh, unpaid uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, initiative so it's like something yes it's something that we don't want to uh, re repeat and it's not possible because we would starve to that but uh, uh, it, it was just one it's not uh, it's definitely not uh, uh, 
uh, an example how to do it in future. Uh, we just wanted to try it once. Yeah. So. We have two questions, one here, one there. Maybe you want to start and then you go, okay? Yeah, it's about <coughs> payment. I, th I think it's for, for everybody a very, very difficult thing because sometimes you really, really want to do a project. Mm -hmm. And then um, you have to make this decision if you go for your like principles or you kind of go for like the nice project, right? But um, I do feel like it's, it's really good to try to, try to continue to convince clients that what you do is like extremely valuable and why would they pay a doctor or a lawyer fees that they never negotiate? They just yeah. pay no, what they ask. Mm -hmm. Why do we always have to negotiate? And I think it's really good if we, um, I, I mean, I don't know your personal situations or the situation at, for each project. But I think it's very easy for clients to say, oh, you're a young architect, and they, they see how eager you are um, is to pay you not enough. And uh, we've even had it in Holland that, like I showed you the competition for the Amsterdam housing earlier today, and um, they invited all these young architects, and they offered us such a bad contract. I never had it, I mean, <laughs> a really, really low fee, but in the contract there was actually mentioned that if we would die during the project, that we would have to pay money to the client because they would suffer. I mean, like, this is how crazy it becomes. So what we did is we just called each other and then we said collectively, like, we knew they were running out of time. It's like, we want to do this project, but we do it for these conditions and we do it for this money. Mm -hmm. And they agreed. So I think also by talking to each other and trying to collectively improve situations, I think is really important. And I think sometimes we can mm -hmm. be a bit more brave yeah. about it, maybe. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it in a way that uh, Partially, the answer is that uh, it, there is, uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, uh, most of the politicians are lawyers. And for instance, lawyers have uh, fixed rates. It's like by law in Slovakia. And uh, architects don't. So architects have to negotiate. So not, not in each country. But for example, mm. in Germany or in, in Austria, it's, it's fixed how much money yeah. the client should pay for public projects. And mm -hmm. so it is possible also within EU regulations um, that mm -hmm. you can fix it. Uh, in Holland, they abandoned the system, and we actually get paid half of what architects got paid 10 years ago. And then we don't even talk about inflation. So uh, I think even in the Netherlands, everybody feels it's like this dream country for architecture, etc. But also the conditions for us has become really, really bad, and uh, we are trying really to change it. But I think you can only do it as a bigger collective instead of individually. It's like, in, in other words, you have to become more political. I don't know. Yeah, but it doesn't mean a bad thing. You don't have to become an activist. I think no, you just have to... No, I, I don't, I, 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 I no, don't I mean being activist. I mean just being political in a way that uh, you can arrange the collective action. You can act uh, collectively, not uh, individually. That's what political... Well, I, I, I once had a client and they said, I said, okay, we spent two more years on this project, two, two more years longer than we agreed for, so we want to renegotiate the contract because we continue to work. And they were like, we really don't understand because it's really nice no, that you can do this project. I was like, yeah, but you know, <laughs> I need to eat. Uh, I just had a baby. I need to pay, pay him food, right? Mm -hmm. So and then they understand and we could renegotiate. But uh, you have to tell them you don't do it out of love only. It's, uh, you need to live somehow, no? <laughs> but Michal, you were referring also the, uh, the, the how basically practices could be empowered by understanding practice as something more collectivized or more based on association also like which is very much connected to the case that you're talking about for instance this competition in which basically all the participants were teaming up to uh, kind of claim the conditions not so this is I something that is actually very interesting. illegal to do this huh? yeah <laughs> But, but Michal was uh, referring to that. I think that it's a very, maybe you can expand a little bit on that. No, I, I think it's a very kind of, kind of a rational thing to do. It's not something theoretical. I mean, for instance, like uh, I don't know how it is uh, somewhere else, but in Slovakia, lawyers have a chamber of lawyers and this uh, chamber can lobby in the parliament and in the parliament there are 150 people and they can do basically anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, you just have to convince uh, 76 uh, people and you, you can establish anything you want. <laughs> and instead of that, like mostly architects, what they do is like, uh, we have to inform the, we have to inform the, the public and we have to uh, uh, make them know what good architecture is and how architecture is beneficial and uh, in time it will come. But uh, I mean, there are 76 people that can do anything you want <laughs> if you convince them. So I mm -hmm. think it's just simple as that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much for your presentation and for the super interesting conversation. Um, I have a question about uh, the space of theory in, in your practice. To, to go a little bit back to sort of the students and what will happen, let's say, after graduation. Uh, what happens fairly often, uh, in, you know, maybe in this school, we were talking a little bit yesterday, is that some students after graduation, they probably get hired by uh, big corporate firms, and uh, in which case uh, he or she will work on projects that could relate in some ways to sustainability, to technology, to a certain extent, maybe even to uh, politics, but probably not to theory. And um, now considering the, the current condition of, of, uh, of the field, that I think we got even a better idea after, after your presentations, you know, with all the problems related to both private and public commissions, uh, I would like to ask how do you find uh, you know, the space for keeping uh, theory as a central element in your, uh, in your projects beside the research that you can conduct related to academia or, uh, or exhibitions? Yeah. Thank you. So for us, uh, the, the only way of working into theory is either lecturing, but mainly at the studio, either doing an editorial project mostly mm -hmm. self-published or you ask for a grant to publish it, or doing a research pro project like um, the one Alessandro was planning with the Fonca grant. So these kind of grants allow, allow you to work maybe for six months or one year into specific subject. And applying for <laughs> grants, it's a kind of job in itself, but I mean, you have to find an equilibrium to be able to do both. Mm -hmm. I think th this is a very, this is a very, this is a very good question because I think what uh, what en what ends up happening, at least in our case, because as I said, w we start with the praxis and let's say the theory or the juice we can extract that we could call theory mm -hmm. comes from an empirical uh, sequence of events. But in the end, we speak five languages. There's a language that me, Anne, and Ahmed speak between the three of us, where we use certain kind of words. There's a second language that is the one that we use within the office, because the office includes a series of people that we need um, to argue and discuss and convince, and maybe it's not as clear for them the motivations of the office as it is for us. Then we need to talk with a client, and we use words like beautiful and gorgeous and mm -hmm. nice and I feel cheap. Cheap, cheap is very important. Uh, and we talk with them in a way that it hurts in our soul a bit, but we do it. Then we need to talk with the contractor, and we need to tell him that it's actually tilted, it's not straight, that it's actually pink, it's not white, and we need to say it several times, because sometimes they paint it three times. Because the three times we said pink, someone had passed by and painted it in white, and they actually tried to explain us that we are wrong. And then finally, we need to talk in lectures and events like this, and we can make, we can make it seem very glamorous and funny, but 99% of the time is painful, as you cannot imagine. So for the 1% we have here, we have 99% of everything else that academia doesn't teach you. They teach you how to do museums, how to write short stories and do narratives. They, ha they don't teach you how bad it is to have a meeting in the municipality with the client where the guy just fucked up but the client thinks you are a moron. They, 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 don't, they don't teach you this. And even if they do, and even if they give you the example case, they don't give you the feeling you feel on that day. They don't... <laughs> so this, this idea that you have to speak different languages, because imagine the following situation. Imagine one of our small private clients showing up and we try to explain him Palladio. And we try, and we keep trying, and we keep failing, and the guy just asks us, yes, but what are the tiles on the bathroom? And this is the difference of these courses. Like, if someone wants to know how the handle is going to look like, and you're talking about symmetry and renaissance and whatever, you're the, run, the one that is wrong. It's not him, because he, doesn't, he didn't ask for that. He just asked for the bathroom. So how, how do you find the... <laughs> no. What Philip said, everything is true. It's a fact, unfortunately. Um, but I think an important part is that um, if we only talk about tiles in bathrooms, we get bored. So if we don't find the the entrance or some or the 
theory behind those projects for ourselves as a practice. Nobody else will care about it, but if we don't, it's a problem. And sometimes it's it could it could be much easier just to say yes and do almost copy paste some projects than the huge effort sometimes we have to convince clients to do something. Um, other times the clients just care about the Excel sheet, mm -hmm. so we actually need to be the ones discussing among ourselves like what to do, what can be interesting or not, because there's no discussion at all with clients. So we have the two opposites, like those that only care about bathrooms and other technical things, and the ones that only care about numbers. Mm -hmm. And if we make a striped facade or a white facade for them, it's the same as long as we fulfill all the square meters and all the, um, the, the prices and the money. So it's really about us as an office trying to find the interest in architectural in the architectural mm -hmm. discourse because in our case of course we have been teaching in um, and doing some small research projects but the main thing is while we do the projects and while we build the projects where we get our fu fuel to actually then find this is an interesting topic and maybe we research on it but as Philip was saying like the practice comes first and the theory yeah. evolves mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Ah, please, please, no, please. I, I was just going to say, during the presentation, I said, uh, I used this metaphor of fighting the windmill. Every time we find a windmill, it's the moment where we are trying to generate theory, let's say. Let's, we are trying to create something more. Because if you want to make good money in architecture, just say yes to the client. That's, that's, that's the whole message. But if you want to, that's, that's the easy way to do it. If you really want to do something meaningful, most of the times, not always, but most of the times, you will not be aligned with the client. So at that moment, you create an enemy, you fight, you you say beautiful and nice and all of those things to try to disguise the actual message. That could, it's like a Troy horse somehow. You try to... <laughs> yes, I think you have to have different strategies to try to send a positive message to the students. For example, our first strategy, we ask for at least three weeks to do a first presentation so that we are sure that that presentation is going to be attractive, it's going to be seductive, and through doing physical models, we have realized that clients have less doubts about what you're talking about than with images or floor plans or drawings in general. So take your time to do a first very good presentation and you'll gain many steps. Then if this doesn't work completely, we have the second strategy, which is <laughs> good cop, bad cop. You can guess who's the <laughs> bad cop and who's the good cop. So we play this during the construction process usually. If this doesn't work, we have a third strategy, which is trying to team up with the constructor so that you get things done without the client realizing, and when he or she gets there, things are ready. And sometimes when they see it's there, they start liking it. And if nothing of, it, of this works, we just learn a new strategy from a friend, Emmanuel, that he calls the silence strategy. So the client says, I want this, and you just don't answer <laughs> for days. <laughs> After some weeks, he writes back, I don't want this. <laughs> OK. There's one, Petko wants to, uh, yeah? Yes, I think we have been talking about uh, communication issues, about how we, be, we are political, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's been super exciting, but I just want to make a very simple question, very straightforward, which is, once babies are born, once your babies are out there, what do you think you leave to the public? What do you think you deliver to the public? Mm -hmm. That's not a straightforward <laughs> question. <laughs> I think having the, the dinner invitation months later after you deliver the the house is a quite a complicated um, meeting, no? <laughs> so at one point you have to abandon the, the, the house or the project, no? I mean, you, you never stop building then. You always have the, the drop that's invading the house. But you, you have to be quite critical when you, when you stop building your project, no? You, you have to go back to the, to the first sketches and see what 
the whole the whole process was all about no and when you actually see the 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 construction finished it has been two years now no for example you're not the same the client is not the same so and it, and it's sad i mean architecture ended no i mean it's like a postpartum i didn't have a baby but it it's it's to give up on on a project is it's a painful thing so and at the same point is a relief no but you you don't know what that is i mean architecture for us i think it stops at the moment you give the the, the drawings to the contractor no well Thank you very much. There's so many questions and hands raised, but maybe we can do it informally because there's now a possibility. So thank you very much. Yeah.